Great. Hi, everyone. First of all, I'd just like to thank you for taking the time to join us for today's webinar uh, on alternative cooling methods for data centers, specifically low energy evaporative cooling. My name is William Trong, and I'm the business development manager here at Nortech, responsible for our data center applications. Joining me today is Lauren Bean, the president at Data Power Technology Corporation. Uh, Lauren's been with Data Power Technology since 1990s and has been specializing in environmental control systems and power protection systems since 1986. So thank you, Lauren, for participating today. So just a brief overview of the learning objectives for today's webinar. Uh, we'll start the presentation today with Lauren, who will provide an overview of the data center vertical market and subcomponents, as well as the trends we're seeing in data center thermal management. We'll then move into evaporative cooling as an alternative to traditional cooling, uh, looking at when and how evaporative cooling becomes the right solution, the basics of evaporative cooling. We'll take a look at, diff at the different evaporative technologies that are available today, and then we'll take a look at some advantages and disadvantages, as well as key design considerations. So the webinar itself will be about 45 minutes long, and we'll have a 15-minute Q&A session afterwards. So feel free to type in any questions you have along the way, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. So with that, uh, let's get started, and I will hand it over to Lauren. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking a little bit of time to join us today for our presentation on evaporative cooling technologies. Again, my name is Lauren Beam with Data Power Technology. And today I'm going to spend about 10 minutes uh, talking about the various types of data centers and where evaporative cooling technologies really play today, where we think they'll play tomorrow, and where they likely won't play in the marketplace. And then we'll get into more of the applications around and the technology side around evaporative cooling. So here at Data Power Technology, we really separate data centers into four basic buckets. And those buckets are hyperscale, co-location, enterprise, and edge. So what is a hyperscale data center? Well, you probably recognize a lot of the names we have up on the, on the screen right now, Facebooks, the Googles, the Apples, the, the Microsofts, Amazons. There are a number of them out there. And these guys really are the largest of the large. And they build to a, really quite a different standard than what we would call uh, enterprise customers. Enterprise being those c companies that you recognize that have data centers inside their buildings. So why does hyperscale build differently? Well, if you look at their, their, their reason for being in the business, it is really to provide direct access to high bandwidth applications to their customers around the country in a cloud platform. And they build on such a large global basis that their, their costs really are, are much higher in terms of KW usage and energy usage. So they build primarily for efficiency and not so much for reliability or uptime. And the reason for that is that they provide their own servers or they buy them from somebody on such a large scale that their costs for those servers are, are not very much. So if they lose a server or they lose an application, they simply switch over to another server. They may switch over com to a complete another building. But because they're building these things so large, they have the ability to do that. And that's what makes their, their business model quite different than a, an enterprise, a co-location, or even an edge. That being the case, they're willing to, to kind of risk their servers more. So you'll see them running at, at return air temperatures you know, as high as, as 95 degrees and supply air temperatures up in, up in the 80s. Um, they will not have the requirements for such tight humidity control. They're not as worried about contaminants coming into their environment, so they'll, they'll use some filtration of outside air. And again, the reason for that is that they're building more for efficiency than they are for reliability. If you think about a 10 megawatt data center, for instance, if you can get one or two points of efficiency gain, think about the electrical energy savings that you have there. So their, their methods of of building these sites are quite different than we're going to talk about when we get into the co-location and the enterprise. So let's move on now and talk about what a co-location center is and what it looks like. When we talk about a co-location data center, really what this is is companies are out there today are building sites for enterprise customers. So let's say a, a principal financial or an American Airlines type customer has decided they don't want to spend the CapEx or the OpEx to build a data center anymore. They would 
rather have somebody else build that for them, operate that site, maintain that site, but that company still wants to put their own servers in that site. So these companies go out and they build the site and they essentially rent either rack space or cage space or some method of space for enterprise customers to come in and deploy their servers, their applications, and then tie into them via the internet from afar. So very different than hyperscale, typically not as large as hyperscale, but at the same time very large sites. They're building for more for high availability, higher, reli higher reliability than they are for efficiency. Everybody's always looking for efficiency, right? But their focus is more high availability, high reliability, because now we're moving into a world where these sites just can't be down. So you're in a little bit of a different application in hyperscale, and because of that, they try to maintain tighter temperature controls, tighter humidity controls, and there's really less use of evaporative cooling technologies in these, these sites today than there are in hyperscale, but we do see some of them, mostly the larger companies like the Equinexes of the world, Rackspace, these kind of guys are beginning to use some evaporative cooling, so it does apply there, but again, it's, it's not nearly what we're seeing in hyperscale. So hopefully you understand now a little bit more about what co-location is. Let's move on now to enterprise data centers. These are really what you've come to know and expect for, for the past 50 years. These companies, I throw a few of them up there, American, Chase, Principal, which you can name any company you want to name out there. And they had traditionally their own data center. These things can be from, from you know, 10 kilowatts up to megawatts, very small to very large sites. They are company owned, company maintained. It's their own CapEx they use to build them, their own OpEx that they use to maintain them. And as you can imagine, efficiency is important, but reliability and availability are more important. The cost for any of these sites to be down is astronomical. So they are very careful in terms of their humidity tolerances, their temperature tolerances. This is really the, the lifeblood of these organizations. But today you're seeing a lot of enterprise customers make the decision, we don't want to spend the money to build it, again the CapEx, or the money to maintain it. So we may go ahead and, and put one of our sites, when I say one of our sites, most of them have a main data center and then a backup data center or a, a type site. They may put one of them out on a colo site and keep one of them in-house. They may also have a hybrid where they have their own data center in-house and they farm some out to a colo or they, they bring some applications in from the cloud. Uh, in fact, the reality of the matter is most enterprise data centers today are doing some of their processing out in the cloud. So hopefully that helps you understand what enterprise data centers are. Now let's move on to edge data centers. This is a an emerging market. It, it's always been there at some level, but when you think about all the closets that you see sprinkled around in any organization today, this is what's been referred to the, as the edge, but it's beginning to take on a bit of a new form, and, and what that is is there are some applications that need to be so close to what the processing is doing that they can't live with the latency that it takes or the time it takes to run that process out to the cloud and then back. So we're seeing a proliferation of what we call edge data centers that are being close to the load. The customer would own the site. They would own the racks. Typically, these are one to five rack type little rooms uh, built to high tolerances, lots of uninterruptible power, uh, precision air conditioning, and they have their own servers in these rooms. And, and these rooms always connect back to their network. So it's sort of an interface to their network and it's also in many cases an interface to the cloud. Evaporative cooling really doesn't apply to these sites because they're just so small that gaining you know, one or 2% efficiency or even 5% really isn't critical to these sites. So you'll hear the term edge thrown around, probably doesn't apply to today's conversation as much as either hyperscale or colo. And as a matter of fact, enterprise really doesn't so much today either. So that gives you the four basic buckets that we put data centers in. And quickly to summarize, it's primarily a hyperscale and a co-location conversation today when we're talking about evaporative cooling, but it's important to understand the needs and the differentiations of both. And, and generally speaking, hyperscale is building more for efficiency than reliability. So they're the biggest play for evaporative cooling. 
Co-location is still building for high reliability, more so than efficiency, but because they're getting so large, they're a little bit of a hybrid where you'll see a little bit of a both applied. So hopefully that helps everybody kind of understand some of these terms that are getting thrown out around out there and what type of data centers there are and where this new emerging evaporative cooling technology is going to fit. That being said, uh, I will stay around at the end of the seminar. If anybody has any questions on this, I'll be happy to answer those questions. But in the meantime, I will turn it back over to William to take us into more of the ap applications and technology of evaporative cooling. That's great. Thanks, Lauren. So the first topic I'd like to talk about are the changes to the ASHRAE thermal guidelines for data processing environments. So in 2011, ASHRAE published a revision which updated the, the guidelines for recommended and allowable temperature and humidity in data centers, uh, as well as the addition of two new classes. So the addition of the data center classes were added to encourage uh, more energy efficient practices like the use of airside economization, which we'll talk about shortly. So looking at the recommended envelope, the recommended temperature range is now 64.4 degrees Fahrenheit to about 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit with a moisture range of 41.9 degree uh, dew point to about 60% RH at a 59 degree dew point. And really that minimum recommended moisture limit is provided to, to protect ESD, uh, protect equipment from ESD induced failures and the high limit is there to pr provide uh, a reduced risk of condensation on the IT equipment itself. So now if we look at the allowable range for an A1 and an A2 class data center, the humidity range is actually 20 to 80 percent. So these expanded ranges allow for data centers in an increased number of locations throughout the world uh, to operate with more hours of economization or free cooling. So let's talk a little bit more about airside economization. So airside economizers use fans and louvers to draw in cooler outside air, which is mixed with warmer return air, in order to maintain a specified environmental condition within the data center. So there's three main modes of operation for economization. And the first is economization over a fairly narrow temperature range with little or no change in the temperature in the data center itself. So in this case, if the outside air condition changes or the internal load changes such that economization cannot provide the desired conditions, uh, typically a chiller system or a backup system will ramp up to provide additional cooling capacity. The second is economization over a slightly wider temperature range where there may be an increase in temperature for a short period of time. So this method allows operators to take advantage of more hours of economization. And the third uh, that we'll look at is a chillerless facility where the data center temperature is higher and will vary uh, over a wide range depending on what the outside air conditions are. So in this case facilities may use supplemental cooling methods like evaporative cooling. So the map that we're looking at here is published by the Green Grid and it effectively illustrates the airside economizer hours based on ASHRAE's recommended range for temperature and humidity. So if we look at the map for North America, the dark blue region shows areas that can operate on 100% fresh air economizer for about 8,500 hours out of the year, so effectively the full year. Now if the IT environmental set points are expanded to the ASHRAE level A2 range, you can see that more locations can operate with a higher number of economizer hours here in, in North America. So if you look at potential energy savings, uh, in a paper published by the NREL, they created psychrometric bins looking at different cooling technologies, including airside economization, uh, as well as airside economization with supplemental evaporative cooling. And what they found is that on average, about 30 to 40 percent uh, potential energy savings were possible using just airside economization compared to uh, traditional DX cooling with even higher potential savings uh, out on the West Coast just because of their climate conditions. So before we go any further, let's take a quick look at the basics of evaporative cooling to see why this type of technology is a great way to reduce energy consumption in a data center. So evaporative cooling technologies have been around for a very, very long time, and even your body uses it as a means to cool down by sweating when you're overheated. Now thermodynamically, the energy required to drive the phase change from liquid water to vapor is the same regardless of how you do it. 
So it takes about 1,063 BTUs of energy to evaporate one pound of water. So with an evaporative system, we're changing the sensible heat in the air to latent heat to evaporate that water. So this is a constant enthalpy process. So if we were to plot it on a site chart, it would follow a line of constant enthalpy. So since the deviation between the enthalpy line and the wet bulb line is fairly small in most cases, you may sometimes uh, hear this referred to as a constant wet bulb process. But because we're changing the sensible to heat to latent heat, the air temperature drops and we get a cooling effect as well. So the only energy that we need to put into the system is the fan power required to move the air and the power to move the water. So that means for every pound of water that we're evaporating, we can achieve about 0.31 kilowatts of free cooling with these types of systems. So the evaporative process can actually provide two benefits for a data center. And the first is, of course, uh, reduced mechanical cooling load from the free cooling effect. And the second is the addition of humidity to help reduce ESD-induced failures. So if we talk about humidification requirements in a data center, in order to minimize ESD-induced failures, uh, this is traditionally done using electrode style of boilers to generate steam for humidification. Uh, these can be either standalone units or small uh, canister units installed in crack units. But in these types of systems, we're effectively putting energy into the system in the form of electricity to boil water. So these can consume quite a lot of electricity and even with uh, Title 24 in California now, they actually restrict the use of non-adiabatic humidification systems in data centers depending on the cooling or the IT loads. So if we were to compare the energy consumption for let's say a 200 pound an hour humidification load, uh, an electrode style of boiler would require about 74, 75 kilowatts of electricity, whereas an evaporative media system could could provide that uh, capacity using less than about 0.3 kilowatts of electricity. So you can see right off the bat that if we need humidification as well, uh, looking at an evaporative media system or an adiabatic system can save quite a lot of energy just on that side alone. Uh, but it is important to keep in mind that with an adiabatic system, the cooling effect and humidity go hand in hand. So as we increase the cooling uh, from an evaporative system, the humidity level also increases. So you just need to keep that in mind to ensure that the moisture content of the air doesn't rise above the recommended or the allowable range. So if we look at the same example based on a 200 pound an hour evaporation rate and an air volume of 20,000 CFM, we could potentially achieve a 10 degree cooling effect using an adiabatic system that consumes less than 0.3 kilowatts of electricity. So this is just a rough back of the, the napkin calculation to give you an idea of what kind of temperature drops we can achieve with this type of system. Now, if we were to couple an airside economizer with an evaporative cooling technology, we could further increase the airside economization hours uh, simply by allowing warmer outside air temperature and cooling it down through the evaporative cooler. So if you look at this on a site chart, any outside air condition in the blue section would be uh, a mixture of humidity control and economizer operation to get us into that recommended range. Uh, and any uh, condition in the yellow section there could be achieved just using straight evaporative cooling. So if we go back and look at the map from the NREL as an air side economizer with the addition of a direct evaporative cooling system, uh, we can see that it significantly increases the average potential energy savings uh, to around 80 to 90 percent over, say, a traditional DX cooling system. Now, certainly the potential energy savings through economization and evaporative SIS uh, will depend on, on your specific climate region and will need to be evaluated for the location of that data center. Uh, the Green Grid actually has a great web-based calculator that you can use to help run estimated cost savings for different locations uh, based on your zip code. So now let's take a look at the different adiabatic technologies that are available today. So there's three main types of evaporative cooling or adiabatic systems. So the first is a wetted media system. So this is a system that probably everyone has heard about. If you've heard the term swamp cooler before, it's effectively the same thing. So this type of system uses a wetted media pad placed directly into the airstream. As air passes through the pad, water is evaporated. The second type of system is an atomizing nozzle system. 
So this type of system atomizes water into small droplets, uh, typically around 10 to 15 microns in size. So these droplets are created by pressurizing the water to roughly around 1,000 psi and spraying those uh, water droplets directly into the airstream using a nozzle array. And the last technology that we'll look at here today is ultrasonic nebulizers. So this type of system uses a series of piezoelectric transducers to effectively break the surface tension of the water to produce a fine mist. So the, the droplet size with this type of system is typically around 1 to 5 microns in size. Now, each of these systems uh, have their own pros and cons, which we'll look at. So really, the technology uh, should be selected based on specific, the specific design requirements. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out is they do all have one thing in common, and that is the need for hygienic operation. So both water quality and maintenance are extremely important whenever we're using an adiabatic system, uh, and that's really to eliminate the risk of bacteria growth and Legionella. So with that said, let's uh, take a look at some of the more common ways that these systems can be applied. So in these examples, we're showing a direct evaporative cooling system, but uh, how any, any of the, the three technologies that we mentioned here can be used. So the first uh, one that we'll look at is a direct evaporative cooling uh, system. So this is probably the most common form of evaporative cooling strategy. So in this case, the humidifier adds moisture directly to the incoming airstream, raising its humidity and reducing its temperature. So in this case, 100% fresh air is used, but you know, warmer return air from the space can be mixed with outside air upstream of the evaporative cooler as well. The advantage here is that this strategy uh, in this strategy is that 100% of the cooling effect is felt by the roof room. Uh, but a disadvantage is that the amount of cooling that we can achieve using direct evaporative cooling is highly dependent on the supply air condition uh, or the incoming air. So air that has a high level, level of humidity already will not be able to absorb as much moisture, uh, reducing the overall cooling potential. The second strategy that we'll look at is indirect evaporative cooling. So this strategy uses outside air to cool an internal environment without uh, allowing external and internal air streams to directly mix. So in this case, cool outside air is drawn through a heat recovery unit, so in this case a plate heat exchanger, uh, then immediately exhausted while internal air is drawn from the room and circulated through the heat recovery unit before being reintroduced into the room. So the outside air cools the internal air through the heat recovery unit without the two air streams directly mixing. Now by adding a, an evaporative cooler on the outside airstream prior to it entering the heat recovery unit, the temperature can be reduced and additional cooling can be achieved without adding moisture directly to the supply air. So this enhances the capacity of the system and makes it uh, effective even during periods when uh, the outside air temperature is warmer than the desired internal, uh, internal room condition. And since the internal air never mixes with the outside air, there's no risk of contamination or external pollutants into the space. Uh, it also allows the velocity of the outside air stream through the heat recovery unit to be much greater than the internal recirculating air, uh, allowing us to scavenge greater levels of cooling from the system. The third strategy that we'll look at is exhaust air cooling. So the strategy uses the exhaust air in combination with the heat recovery unit to effectively pre-treat the supply air prior to it being uh, introduced into the room. So when air is extracted from the room, it's typically warmer than the incoming air and not really suitable for use in cooling. But by humidifying the exhaust air with an evaporative cooler and reducing its temperature uh, below that of the incoming air, we can run it through the heat recovery unit and cool the incoming supply air. Now, during summer months, this can reduce the temperature of the incoming air by several degrees and uh, as well as lower the need for DX cooling. During winter months, the warmer exhaust air can be used without the humidifier to preheat the incoming air, uh, allowing reduced heating costs in, in, in the winter months. Uh, as there's no mixing of the air streams, there's no moisture added to the incoming air, so cooling here occurs irrespective of the incoming air's humidity level. So let's take a look at each of these technologies in a little bit more detail, starting with a wetted media system. So this type of system uses a wetted media pad placed directly near the airstream 
And typically this media is going to be a glass fiber media or polyester media, uh, sometimes even a cellulose or paper-based media. But the media is effectively saturated with water. Uh, as warm, dry air passes through the media, water is evaporated and uh, we get cool, humidified air on the discharge side. Now, all the evaporation in this type of system occurs within the depth of the media pad itself. Now, in order to help overall uh, help reduce overall water usage, the, the water that's not evaporated typically falls into a pan, which is then recirculated and pumped back to the top of the media. Now, one of the main benefits to using an evaporative media system uh, is that it can operate on any type of water. Um, so it can run on potable water or treated water, so RO or DI. Uh, unlike an atomizing system or an ultrasonic system that do require treated water. So as water is evaporated from the system, minerals in the water will begin to concentrate and form a scale uh, on the surface of the media itself. Uh, as a means to help control the mineral buildup, uh, these systems will typically uh, perform a blowdown cycle to drain some of that water out while bringing in fresh makeup water. So very, very little energy is required to operate this type of system, essentially just the power needed to pump the water over top of the media. Uh, there will be uh, some additional fan power required to overcome the pressure drop, uh, but it's still fair, fairly low compared to traditional cooling systems. Now, a consideration that you should keep in mind when using an evaporative media system is the controllability. So the media itself will require a, a time to fully wet and fully dry. So the system will be a little bit slower to respond to changes in demand. So depending on your requirements, you may also need to implement uh, a different control strategy, uh, something like base and bypass damper, if you do, do need tighter control of the leaving air conditions. So the next technology we'll look at is the atomizing nozzle system. Uh, so as I mentioned, this type of system works by spraying high pressure water directly into the air, air stream to be evaporated. Now, compared to an evaporative media system, these will typically consume more energy due to the water treatment system and the pump motor, but still much less than uh, traditional DX cooling systems. So, to give you an example, a system capable of producing about 1,700 pounds per hour uh, will consume about 3 kilowatts of electricity, including the water treatment system. Now, as I mentioned, unlike evaporative media systems, as soon as uh, there's a demand for uh, the system to start, as soon as there's a demand, the system will start spraying water immediately. So one of the nice things about these systems is they're capable of stage control. So they're able to control uh, to a plus or minus 2% control accuracy, unlike an evaporative media system. Uh, any unevaporated water is typically caught by a droplet separator or mist eliminator that's installed downstream uh, from the nozzle array. The evaporation efficiency will depend on the entering air conditions, so temperature and RH, the air velocity, and the absorption distance, so the distance that we have for spraying that water. Uh, so typically with higher velocities or shorter absorption distances, the contact time between the air and the water will be less, so we have less water that can be evaporated. Uh, I also mentioned that this type of system does require treated water, so either RO or DI water. So this is a requirement in order to ensure that there are no minerals that can precipitate out as the droplets evaporate, which could create a dust that can clog the mist eliminators uh, or make its way down into the space as well. The treated water is also important to prevent scaling and, and clogging of the nozzles themselves. So typically with this type of system, any unevaporated water that comes off of the droplet separator uh, will get sent directly to drain. So it's important to ensure that these systems are designed uh, properly to ensure the highest possible evaporation efficiency and, and minimize the amount of waste water. So we typically try and design these for an evaporation efficiency uh, between about 70 to 85 percent. Now, depending on the design of the water system itself, uh, the water coming off the droplet separators can sometimes be reclaimed and run back through the water treatment uh, in order to, to help reduce the overall water usage of the system. Now, due to the requirement for that treated water, the total water consumption for an atomizing system uh, will typically be higher than for a comparable evaporative media system operating on potable water. And that's simply because of the, uh, the concentrator, the wastewater that's generated from the water treatment system itself. 
Uh, so this definitely needs to be considered in the total cost of ownership when selecting an ADVAC technology. The last technology that we'll cover here is ultrasonic systems. So this type of system uses a series of piezoelectric transducers that oscillate at an ultrasonic fre frequency which causes cavitation in the water, uh, which effectively releases uh, an ultrafine mist into the airstream. So as with atomizing nozzle systems, ultrasonic units do also require treated water uh, in order to prevent dusting as well as to prevent transducers from scaling up. Now a design consideration for these types of systems is uh, scalability. The ultrasonic units are typically smaller in capacity compared to the other types of systems with outputs uh, typically less than about 100 pounds per hour for a single unit compared to uh, say an evaporative media system or a nozzle system that can easily provide you know, up to 2,000 pounds an hour from a single system. So for that reason, ultrasonic units are typically more cost effective for smaller data centers. And in terms of energy consumption, you know, a typical 40 pound an, ultrason 40 pound an hour ultrasonic unit will consume just under uh, one kilowatt of electricity, including a blower fan. So one of the main benefits to uh, the ultrasonic units is that due to the smaller droplet size that they generate, uh, they can actually be installed either inside of a ducted system or directly into the white space with a blower fan to help distribute the mist. Because the droplet size is smaller than, you know, say, an atomizing nozzle system, the absorption distance is, is typically fairly short. Now, additionally, in data centers that are using 100% recirculated air and cooling via crack units, the humidity load from the mechanical loads is, is negligible, but we may need to compensate for humidity loads from infiltration. So in this type of scenario, you know, we can use an ultrasonic unit placed directly into the space uh, to help maintain those humidity set points. So now that we've looked at the different technologies, let's take a look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of using an ADVAC system for cooling. Uh, and potentially humidification. So let's start with the advantages. The, the clear advantage here is potential energy savings compared to traditional DX cooling. So depending on your climate location, you may, you may be able to completely eliminate the need for mechanical cooling itself. Uh, and even if you, you can't or you can't operate the system on economizer with evaporative cyst year-round, there still may be considerable savings by reducing the operational hours of the DX cooling system. By centralizing the cooling equipment outside of the data center or the white space, uh, the white space itself can be maximized to, fully, uh, to be fully utilized by the IT equipment. Uh, another advantage here is that in areas where the outside air dew point is outside of the acceptable range and we may need supplemental humidification, ADVAC systems can provide very, very low cost humidification compared to uh, the cost of, say, traditional steam humidification. Uh, you know, we looked at indirect cooling solutions as well, and these can be used to provide low-cost cooling in areas where direct evaporative cooling uh, may not really be feasible due to the outdoor air conditions or if there's a risk for outdoor air pollutants. And, and the last advantage here is that ADVAC systems can also be customized or scaled to meet design requirements. So large capacity systems um, you know, are better suited towards potentially the evaporative media systems or high pressure nozzle systems, you know, those are easily scalable to, you know, one, two, three thousand pound an hour systems, uh, depending on, on, on the, uh, the data center requirements. So looking at some of the disadvantages here, um, in order to really apply an evaporative media system or an atomizing nozzle system, we do need a ducted air distribution system. So if it's a retrofit application or an existing data center, it may be difficult to find, uh, to find that room if there's no ducted system. Um, and typically, the, these systems do need uh, a stainless steel wet section as well. So if there is a ducted section or an air, air handler, if you're doing a retrofit application, it may be difficult to find that amount of space to install the equipment itself. Now, as I mentioned, atomizing nozzle systems and ultrasonic systems do require treated water. So in addition to the cost of the water treatment equipment, you need to consider the water consumption as well. 
So over the last few years, water usage efficiency has become uh, a very important metric that, that data center designers are looking at more, more closely as well as energy efficiency, um, you know, especially in areas that are experiencing droughts. So if we look at an RO system, you know, the recovery rates for an RO system can be as low as about 50%. So that means for every gallon of, of treated water that we need out of the system, we would need to supply two gallons of untreated water. Now, there are high efficiency membranes available that can help reduce that wastewater, but the cost of the water treatment still needs to be considered, especially for large capacity systems. Uh, another disadvantage here is that in the event that the outside air conditions are not really favorable for economization, uh, or there's a risk of outside pollutants, you know, if there's a fire outside or there's smoke, supplemental backup cooling systems may still be required in addition to an evaporative cooling system. And the last, not really a disadvantage, but just something that I want to mention here is that maintenance for these types of systems is extremely important um, whenever you're using an adiabatic system. So not only to ensure uh, the highest possible efficiency for the system, but also to ensure hygienic operation. So let's take a look at uh, just a few of the key design considerations when you're looking at uh, an adiabatic system. So the first is, of course, is this a new build or is it a retrofit application? Uh, you know, certainly the max savings potentials are available if the adiabatic system is included during the initial design phase. So you know, evaporative meat these systems and atomizing all systems, you know, in most cases require a ducted air distribution system. Uh, as I mentioned, with you know, if it's an all system, four to five feet of unobstructed duct. So if, we're, if we have to retrofit it, it may not really be a cost-effective solution depending on the, the conditions or how much cooling we can achieve from that system. Uh, the second is the location of the data center. So determining whether using a direct evaporative cooling is a cost-effective and feasible solution or you know, possibly maybe an indirect solution might work better depending on the, the outside air conditions. So as I mentioned, the Green Grid has a, has a great online calculator that, that can help you estimate the hours of free cooling as well as estimated cost savings based on average weather data for a specific location. So be sure to check that out if, if you are interested. Uh, the third here is, is risk tolerance. So how risk adverse is the data center owner? Um, you know, is, is the owner willing to open up the range, uh, the allowable range for temperature and humidity to really take advantage of that free cooling effect? And the, the last design consideration here is uh, the, the total cost of ownership. So the addition of a, an adiabatic system, you know, whether it's an evaporative media system, nozzle system, or ultrasonic unit, uh, there's going to be maintenance requirements. So it's definitely something that you need to consider in the total cost of ownership. So media systems will require uh, replacement on the media, uh, typically every three to five years if it's running on potable water. Um, Pumps on the high-pressure nozzle systems will need to be rebuilt or replaced every few thousand hours. Transducers on ultrasonic units will need to be replaced. So definitely you have to keep in mind the, the maintenance requirements um, on these types of systems. So uh, in addition to that, you do also want to consider the, the need for treated water if you're looking at an atomizing nozzle system or uh, an ultrasonic unit. So definitely there's the added cost for the water, tr water treatment equipment itself as well as the water usage. So just to summarize here, you know, it's clear that there are significant energy savings available from the use of economizers with evaporative cysts, uh, and potentially even more savings available if the operating, operating range for the data center is opened up to the actually allowable range for temperature and humidity. Uh, but it is important to keep in mind that, uh, you know, really to maximize these savings, it's, you, you, you need to evaluate this type of system uh, in the initial design phase to, uh, to maximize those savings. So that's all, all we really have there for the presentation. We've got about 15 minutes here uh, for questions. So any questions that you have, feel free to type them in and, uh, and we can answer them as we go. Uh, so, Lauren, we've got a question here that maybe you might be able to help answer. Uh, the question is, who pays, who pays 
for the operating cost in a co-location type data center. The customer of the rented space or the colo, the ratio. Yeah. That's a good question. The co-location company typically pays the energy company and then bills back the actual enterprise customer based on use of KW. That's the typical model. So at the end of the day, the customer or the enterprise customer ends up paying that. Perfect. Thanks, Lauren. So that looks like it was the only question. We'll wait, uh, wait a couple more minutes here and see if there's uh, any additional questions. Uh, so in addition to that, Lauren, sorry, uh, same topic. So would they pay uh, for the temp and humidity as well? Yeah, that's another good question. So there are multiple models in the co-location world. Different co-location companies have different methods of billing back to the customers. But one thing I can promise you is they're all pretty plugged into what their energy costs are, whether that's the energy required to, to provide humidity control, the energy re required in and inefficiencies of uninterruptible power systems, the energy required for the actual server KW usage or whatever it is, all of them look at what their costs are for the ener that energy and it gets built back in some form or fashion to the enterprise customer. Perfect. Thanks, Lauren. That looks like it's uh, that's it for the questions. Again, uh, if if anyone out there does have a specific question, either for Lauren or myself, our email addresses are are up here as well. Uh, feel free to send us an email directly, and uh, and we can we can help you out there. Um, I will also mention that uh, this webinar is recorded, so it will be available online. Uh, my apologies, I did hit the start recording button a little bit late, um, but the full PowerPoint presentation is going to be available as a handout as well. Um, if you would like uh, a copy of it separately, just let us know and we can, uh, we can send you a copy. Uh, Lauren, did you have anything else that you wanted to add, add or, or mention? No, just uh, I'll, I'll repeat what you said. Feel free to shoot me any emails if somebody has a question or even wants to reach out to me to, to discuss anything in more detail. I appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, obviously, this is an, an emerging technology, and honestly, it still isn't completely vetted out in the marketplace, so we'll see this continuing to grow over time and probably getting a little bit larger. It'll settle itself out, but we're always here for questions and happy to answer those. That's great. Well, thank you guys uh, for, for taking the time to join us today. Uh, again, any questions, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, and uh, thank, thank you, Lauren, for, for participating today.